we are live now. Uh, hello, Chad. This is Enzo here. I'm, I'm uh, with uh, SAP right now, and I'm a learning strategist for SAP. And uh, I'm always trying to figure out new technologies, old technologies, new trends, old trends, and how to make sense of them so that our team can then go in and design some amazing experiences there for our learners. And today we have Chad here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? We're going to talk about mobile learning. Right. Certainly. Uh, thanks for uh, having me here, Enzo, and uh, always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, my name is Chad Udell. Uh, I work for Float. Uh, I am the managing director at Float. Float is a mobile uh, consultancy. We do enterprise uh, applications, uh, a considerable amount of them in the uh, learning and training area. I uh, have been in business since 2010, and uh, you know I have a couple books in the space. Uh, in 2012, I wrote Learning Everywhere, How Mobile Content Strategies Are Transforming Training. And then in 2014, uh, myself and Gary Woodle uh, co-edited and co-authored, along with a number of other Float team members, a book called Mastering Mobile Learning Tips and Techniques for Success. Uh, both of those books are available on Amazon, and both of the books are co-published or published through uh, ATD Press. So they're also available at ATD. So if you're an ATD member, you can get a discounted price uh, purchasing through them as well. So, yeah, I've been in the space for a while, and uh, I, my bulk of my day is spent uh, designing, con concepting, working with developers, and uh, testing, and and uh, you know, doing all of the ideation and associated business uh, requirements around uh, building mobile experiences. So, this is something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. So, thanks for having me here. Oh, that's cool. I, I, that's, that goes right into one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is what does your day look like? So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I partner and work very closely with our customers. So I spend a considerable amount of time, um, you know, presenting our work and uh, discussing with them about what they might want to have in their applications, uh, gathering requirements, uh, helping share their vision with our designers and developers. Um, I actually, come from a graphic design and uh, design background, so I, I do take a pretty active hand in collaborating with the designers. And uh, for a brief stint of time, uh, I was also a developer and coder, so uh, I, am, I know just enough in that area to be dangerous as well. But uh, my day-to-day -day is, uh, I would probably say, spent around 20 to 30% on uh, client issues, working with them, 20 to 30% working on with my uh, designers and developers, and the rest of the time is spent uh, kind of managing the business and uh, handling a lot of the uh, overall uh, higher level uh, discussions related to strategy and where we want to take float and what we're doing uh, going forward. Oh, very cool. Uh, so, and that's that leads to one question that I had as well is, um, I guess we, we all can relate, right? When we're trying to pitch an idea to our to a client, uh, they they want to do mobile learning, but they don't know where to go. How do you even pitch ideas to them based on their 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 and how do you do that? Like, to, you know, there are so many factors out there, like screen sizes, all that kind of stuff, different types of interactivity. How do you uh, gather their 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 problems and then propose a solution to them. What's the process like? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good discussion um, and something I'm definitely uh, willing to explore a little bit with you. You know, the 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 uh, there's a, a quote that's attributed to Steve Jobs is that how will they know what they want or how will they know what they they want when they they don't even have an idea what the capabilities are. You know, and I think a lot of a lot of my responsibility and a lot of Float's responsibility as a business and uh, as, as leaders in the industry is to help kind of paint that picture of, of what is possible and what is uh, what this new uh, delivery platform, whether it be mobile or smart uh, phones, uh, tablets, wearables, even Internet of Things and sensors and a variety of other stuff, what this is all capable of. Because the, the entire um, paradigm of learning shifts when the context is expanded to include basically every facet of your life you know when when mo when learning is no longer constrained to a specific event uh, but becomes basically part of your total uh, life experience um, the learning experiences and the things that you can actually create and deploy in order to affect somebody's day-to-day -day, uh, becomes 
multiplied uh, exponentially, really. I mean, the, the overall possibilities become far more uh, interesting. Uh, we are no longer trapped to some sort of um, read-only experience where people are forced to click monotonously through a next button, but rather we can actually provide them contextual tools and useful information and even notify them about things that they might not know before they even realize that uh, that they're going to have to know about it, right? Like we can we can alert the user as they enter their office, hey, such and such situation or context has changed and your day just got a lot more interesting or uh, you know, challenges have arisen and here's a whole new uh, set of instructions and pieces of materials or uh, things that you're going to need to do in order to interact with and be successful in your job today or tomorrow or whenever that might be, right? And so a lot of our time, like what we spend considerable amount of time doing is uh, finding out really what the root problem is that the, that the audience that the, that the customer is trying to solve. Because oftentimes uh, I find, uh, especially when, you know, uh, we we're doing a lot of workshop training design or even e-learning design is that uh, learning is really brought into the situation so far down the path that really we're not even treating a root problem, but rather trying to fix symptoms of that problem, you know? And, and if we take a look at what we're doing and, and just remove the whole kind of instructional design or um, uh, kind of construct that we're trying to, that we're focused on building training or that everything has to be, every nail has to be hit with a training hammer, but rather that we are experienced designers, you know, and that we are information designers, uh, then that then that's where innovation can flow. You know, so uh, as much of it uh, going to the customer and helping them see what what they can do, you really have to start to take a look inward and see what am I actually capable of doing. You know, and and you're probably capable of doing a lot more than what you have given yourself credit to. Not, I'm not talking about you specifically, Enzo. I'm talking about just us as a community in general. We are capable of doing so much more than what we give ourselves credit for. Yeah, yeah, that is so true. And sometimes a client will come to you, and you're an instructional designer, learning strategist, uh, developer, and they come to you and say, "I want training," and you go straight to uh, PowerPoint or, or a typical authoring tool and all that. When maybe what the person needed was just in time information, just like. And in our field, even uh, just big thing just in time learning and all that and you know maybe five years ago or so just in time learning was let's send them uh, something with articulate storyline that was good to storyline that they have to sit in front of a laptop to actually do it uh, not you know there's the right time for that as well but uh, we get confused just in time you know what does that mean and now now with this this is really just in time and wearables which I forgot my watch so I can't really do just in time today yeah, uh, you know, uh, we we just get into boxes. We fit ourselves into boxes, like you're saying. You know, in, okay, I'm an instruction designer. I'm going to create content. Yeah, and, and sometimes you know, we just need to create context. We we missed a huge opportunity. I really think that the learning and development industry missed a huge opportunity in the early 2000s, even the mid 2000s, when most of our business processes became digitized. You know. I mean, most businesses, and I know you work for SAP, so uh, SAP is all about the digitization of business, right? I mean, that's your entire thing, you know? And as businesses became increasingly digital, and as businesses now are predominantly digital, they are, by extension, having to become mobile as well. Digital infers, really, in this kind of world, that you are mobile. And so as processes become mobilized and as experiences become mobile first or mobile friendly what we need to do as as learning and development people is kind of put the brakes on things and say you know what as you go to mobile as you take this digital process and move it to a mobile context or mo mobile first experience learning and development wants to be part of this from the very beginning and we want to establish the use help establish the use case understand the user design patterns that are required to solve the problem, ensure that they're being adequately tested and accepted, right? 
And then along with that, make sure that if there are gaps, knowledge gaps that occur, that we can embed or place information into the directly into the experience whenever possible. Thinking of training, thinking of learning, whether it be digital, mobile, e-learning, whatever, as an adjunct or an add-on is a losing battle. To think that you are going to become the darling, the bell of the ball, the, the beautiful uh, butterfly that everybody in the enterprise wants to use, if your deliverables are all tucked away into some crusty old system that they don't see every single day, you, you're, you're bound for failure. So get your materials embedded into the experiences. Now people say, well, Chad, that's, that's just performance support. That's not training. Well, you could look at it that way, or you could say, this is just-in-time learning materials, right? And you hope that there will be use, reuse, drip, subscription, and uh, retention through repeti repetition, you know, that you are creating a habit. You are creating something that they can rely on, you know, and, and right now expecting when somebody goes, oh, wait, you know what, before I do such and such task on my job, I better take that e-learning course. I mean, come on. Yeah. We, yeah. Let's, let's we not happen. Unless, and, but you know, when, you know, when e-learning gets taken and you know this, you can see the analytics and you can see the reports. It's basically the week before the compliance report is going to be read by their manager. <laughs> that is so true. Or a week later, which is worse. Yeah, exactly. After they get uh, after they get brought into the office and they're like, "Wow, well, we noticed you haven't taken these three training courses. You better you better do that." That is so true. It's because we sometimes or many times we don't think of learning as a continuum and then we're just helping create context for that experience to happen. People are already learning. Now, do you want them to get to your content that is optimized for what they are doing right now or do you want them to waste time and go Google something? You know, when you had that opportunity, just like you're saying, to get they need it supported when they need it by the information that you're giving them right we don't want many times you know I, I would think we don't want people to just stop what they're doing just like I said like whenever you're doing a, a, a video game for example and you're playing a video game the game industry knows this you know, uh, inside and out you're playing, playing Assassin's Creed you don't stop to watch a video about Assassin's Creed and here are the buttons that you do and all that to then go 30 minutes later play Assassin's Creed right you go into the game and embed it into the first time that you get in touch with the game the first phase that you're playing you see tutorials in, in Assassin's Creed's case which is one of the favorite uh, favorite video games anyway it, it you see sh a shadow a projected shadow of you doing it right ahead of like if you're going if your next challenge as a character is to jump over a wall you see a little shadow there a specter going jumping over the wall showing you how to do it it's right there embedded in the experience and that's where mobile can do that as well right absolutely without a doubt yeah I, as an ad as a add on to that there's a there's a really fantastic video and i don't have the link of it readily available but it explains how, uh, from a game design perspective, the original Mega Man series is an excellent educational experience. So, because it does that exact same thing, it educates you on what you're going to need as a skill to succeed before you actually need it. It helps you model the behavior, it shows you, illustrates how it's going to help you in the future, and then you you perform well. And you know, I I am a uh, I'm also a a, a coach. For, uh, for my son's uh, football team. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do, you know, every single night at practice. You know, mm -hmm. we, run, we run the plays dozens and dozens and dozens of times, you know, and we do that uh, at, at quarter speed or step by step, and then we speed it up to half speed, and we speed it up to full speed, and then we scrimmage against the full team, and then we scrimmage against another team, and then we have a regular, you know, uh, uh, game. And, and how many work environments work in that sort of same, you know, step-by-step -step model, 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 grow faster, 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 full speed? Like none of them, right? Almost, almost none of them. Yeah, it's all like stop what you're doing, go through this training, and then continue what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and in production, <laughs> while you go through the boring training normally. Right, and so that's that's really you know as I I want to flow into the next kind of topic which I know that you had asked me about and that is that you know some people say that mobile 
is, uh, is dying or it's irrelevant or it's no longer a specific thing. And, and you know, I, I kind of understand, maybe I understand the, the point of view on, on what, that, what that means. And, and I, I hope it means, I'm looking at it from the optimistic lens because I, I like building and designing for the mobile context. What I think that people are trying to say is that it's no longer a separate or different discipline than other learning uh, design and development uh, tasks might be. Now, I hope it's I hope it is that because you know what we're thinking about here is that as we move forward to this digitized processes where we move our businesses to a mobile first kind of environment, we are talking about everything will have to be designed for the mobile context. Now, if that's what we're talking about, then I'm all about saying, okay, yes, mobile learning is dead. Long live mobile learning. You know. But if we're saying, uh, you know, mobile as the delivery method did not work, and so therefore let's retreat to our uh, web-based training or our e-learning or something like that, then I am I am certainly going to shut that type of discussion down because I think I think that's counterproductive, and it actually continues to preclude or squish learning and development away from the rest of the enterprise. And if, if yeah. learning and development doesn't continue to grow and evolve like the rest of the business. Uh, community and like the rest of the business teams in your side of your business do, then then you will be constrained. You will be relegated to uh, irrelevance, right? And we're already starting to see that because what teams get cut first when there are downsizing? What teams get cut first when there's layoffs or the market takes a, a south, south turn? You know, it's learning and development oftentimes feels the punch before production does and maybe even before marketing does. And definitely before sales does. So yeah. we have to establish the business need. We have to establish what the value proposition is for what learning and development is. And so that requires us to get our tools, to get our products out there in the, the, in the realm of the rest of the line of business software and out there with the operations teams in order to make sure just how valuable we are. Awesome. That is awesome. That that's that, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, it, it's I think what is um, maybe what doesn't help the uh, the idea of mobile for learning is is that idea that m there is something called mobile learning that is a separate thing that you do that is called mobile learning. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, I don't know instead of uh, just in, uh, investigating how mobile can be better used for learning to help the learning context there is this separate thing that you have to specialize in called mobile learning yeah um, and yeah that's and where some people miss I, I agree I think that that's fair I think that people get hung up on thinking that the word mobile in mobile learning uh, refers to the phone or the smart uh, tablet or the glasses or the wearable and in reality the mobile in mobile learning is actually the mobile learner it is the fact that the learner is mobile right they are moving about they, have, they are no longer confined or constrained to their desk or their workspace or something like that. They're in their car. They're at a Starbucks. They're out at the job site. They're meeting with the client. They're walking the rounds and inspecting the equipment that's out there on the, on the sales floor or out there at the work site or whatever it is. They are learning while they're doing their job. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. We, we should probably just close right there, right? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but I, I wanted to hear from you some, some um, I'm sure you do, probably most of your work is custom and all that, but when thinking of taking advantage of mobile, but mobile device uh, available uh, technologies that are different from just desktop environments and stuff, yeah. what are some of the, the, the most interesting use cases you've seen for mobile specific learning experiences or mobile assisted learning experience and and what what are some of the authoring tools or environments that you use maybe somebody wants to go right into doing mobile first we're going to start with mobile uh, what did, what should they do yep well uh, you know flood at float we are lucky enough to have some very very skillful uh, user interface and user experience designers that understand the mobile context first and foremost your designers need to understand the basic kind of rules of the road on what makes a good mobile user interface and user experience. This will prevent you from nasty programmer art. This will prevent you from 
shrinking your computer interface down to a single column type of thing like that, right? You need to understand and respect how the user is going to interact with the system and you need to test it. So that's, first and foremost, that's our probably our most important tool in our entire toolbox. Our developers as well, like I said, we're very lucky to have skillful designers. We have equally skillful, if not more so skillful developers. And Float has a team of uh, seven developers. We got full, full time Android and iOS, and they are skillful in their respective native toolkits, but then also cross platform toolkits uh, as well. And so, you know, a number of our experiences are available for Android and iOS. And depending on the functional requirements, we do use toolkits that allow you to develop and deploy on multiple platforms. But we also require, you know, some of the experiences are so specialized that, you know, if you're going to write an iPhone app and it's only going to be on iPhone, we do use native, um, either Objective-C or now Swift. Our developers are really loving the Swift programming language because it is a bit easier to get up to speed and running with. The name Swift is definitely fit, uh, fitting because you write a little bit less code, actually quite a bit less code than typical Objective-C, and it is just easier and quicker to debug and fix when things go kind of haywire. So those are some of the, the things that we have in our toolkit that we use uh, right away. Um, uh, some things that I think you asked a question about, like understanding the capabilities of mobile devices and some of the things that might be possible. Well, you know, over the last couple of years, Float has written a number of pieces on this. Uh, we have a free white paper available through GoWithFloat.com. Uh, it was actually co-authored with Jeff Stead. I don't know if do you know Jeff. Jeff was he was with Qualcomm for a number of years. Before that, he was with Tribal, a UK-based mobile learning consultancy company, and now he works for uh, Cambridge University. And uh, we wrote a paper together called Champions, and that's a, it's a nine-node uh, framework for creating uh, mobile-first experiences. It is an acronym. Champions is contextual, high-speed, ambient, mobile, personal, interactive, open, networked, and social. And so what we do is we evaluate the solutions on how they take advantage of all of those particular kind of affordances that the mobile platforms allow our learners to have. And depending on how effective they are at taking advantage of those types of um, context uh, clues, if you will, um, then probably the better off you're going to be at serving the user's needs. And that's free. It, we don't charge for that. You can continue to use, you can use Champions as a design pattern to help you build your experiences. And then we have a number of other white papers and blog articles related to affordances. You know, we track about 30 or so unique device affordances at Float, uh, everything from geolocation to cameras to accelerometers, uh, barometers, thermometers, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, gyroscope. I'm trying to remember. There's like 30 of them, right? And so we talk about how you can use each one of those uh, to build your uh, idealized mobile experience. And I actually have this uh, concept that Gary and I worked out together, and we, we talk about it as recombinant innovation. Now, recombinant, uh, you know, you might hear recombinant in, re in relation to genetics and possibilities with uh, DNA and things like that, right? The DNA becomes recombinant, like becomes exponentially larger uh, as you add more and more uh, nodes or, or pieces into the, that combination. Likewise with mobile, uh, you know, the more types of affordances that you leverage by putting together, you are creating recombinant innovation. And we talk through, um, you know, the possibilities, you know, two different affordances, you know, you're talking two. You add three, then we're talking six. You add to go up to uh, four, and then we're starting to talk 12. And then we're talking, you know, more and more and more and more. Um, and uh, what, we're, what we're doing is we're actually showing you just how interesting things can get. So uh, I urge you that you go through that particular kind of uh, process to understand just how varied the experiences actually are. I'm getting a text message here, and there's a little bit of speed uh, maybe on the call. I want to make sure that everybody is still able to see me. So I'm just going to kind of do a soft show, soft shoe here. Uh, check my Pokemon, see if there's anybody that's popped up here. No, we're looking good. What we're talking about is this idea of combining multiple uh, innovative pieces of technologies uh, in order to create uh, ex more unique uh, user experiences. And I'm trying to find the uh, blog article here. 
So let me see here. Recombinant, how to improve enterprise apps with human-centered design and recombinant innovation. And I have a, uh, a link. I'm just going to paste it into the chat here because why not? Um, but this article here came out a couple months ago and just explains this, this idea, this concept that, you know, um, mobile experiences that we use on a day-to-day -day basis are unique and different because of the fact that they take advantage of all of these different uh, um, affordances, right? So the concept of, of Uber as a car that picks up a human isn't particularly unique uh, until you can combine Uber with the really slick mobile user experience that it also leverages, right? Or if you take videos, even videos online, uh, like YouTube, but then you add a recommendation engine, then you can get something like Netflix. Or you take a restaurant review, and then you add GPS, and then you get Yelp, you know? Like, so you think about like how all of these experiences come together. They require the combination of multiple awesome things that make mobile very good, right? So think about adding geolocation capabilities and notifications together. Well, then you can have geofences or reminders that include specific items or to-do lists that are triggered when you get to your office, right? You wouldn't be able to do that without the mobile context and without those affordances that those devices have. So I, I was just wondering, how do you, as an individual or as uh, a team leader uh, of instructional designers and developers, how do they move from the uh, uh, knee-jerk reaction that is maybe uh, the solution is always something created with an authoring tool like Captivate or Storyline or, or similar tools into I want to build something that is a mobile experience. Sure. Taking advantage, full advantage of mobile devices, of the fact that the learner is mobile, etc. How do they start with that? Yeah. Mobile first. I mean, I, I think that you come in, you have to come in obviously with an open mind, but there are some ideation processes and there are some. Um, some, some tools that, that you can start to employ, and I, I recommend these, uh, you know, when I do different workshops, and I've demonstrated them at various workshops. Uh, one that is very, very useful is uh, the concept of five whys. I don't know, Enzo, are you familiar with five whys? The, that is a process. Have you heard of that before? You explain to us. So, the, I mean, it's an it's a innovation uh, platform or, or tool, if you will, that's been around believe it or not, for basically 100 years or more, uh, was actually created by uh, the founders of the Toyota Corporation um, ages ago, right? And so the concept is that when someone presents a problem to you that they want to have solved, you immediately ask them, basically, uh, obviously you have to do this tactfully and in whatever way is culturally acceptable at your company, why? Why do you suppose that this is the problem? And then they'll provide you an answer, and then you say, why? Why do you propose that this is the answer to that particular problem? And then you say, why? Why do you propose that that situation arose, and then why, and then why, and why? You have to get five layers deep before you actually get to the root problem. Now, the root problem may actually not be solved or best solved by training. It may be best solved by redesigning the actual business process itself. It may be solved by an HR process that let bad hires into the uh, company in the first place, right? The why may actually result and point to a mobile experience or an application. Not really quite sure. But what we're, we're trying to do is not put, make mobile another Band-Aid. I don't want to put mobile into a situation where it's going to fail, just like you shouldn't want to put training or learning materials into a situation where it's going to fail. So I like to use something like the five whys in order to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that we're, we're solving the correct problem. That's one tool that I use that, that helps us not just jump to a conclusion and build the wrong thing. Another, uh, another maybe less uh, abstract or, or um, uh, more recent, anyway, tool is um, there's a, a book called The Six Thinking Hats, um, and I like to use that as a tool. That was actually an ideation tool that came from IBM in the early 80s. And um, there are six hats. Each hat is represented by a color. Red hat, black hat, blue hat, green hat, yellow hat, white hat. And each one has a specific mode or mentality um, that you are supposed to basically put your mind into 
and think only thoughts around that particular angle, at least for the duration of the time that you're using that particular hat. So black hat is the cynic, white hat is the data, yellow hat is the uh, 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 friendly, and uh, green hat is the nurturing, blue hat is the process or the rationale, red hat is the emotional or sometimes negative uh, cynical look to it, right? And what you do is instead of your brain working through a process where you kind of jump from I'm cynical and then I'm happy and then this and this and this, is you work through, okay, let's only think about the positive things that can happen. Let's game out all of the negative things that can happen. Let's figure out where all of the data might live and lie that we need to find out, right? And so you work through each one of those particular angles of the catalog those thoughts, and then you determine which ones are higher priority or lesser priority or which ones are basically a red herring or a false flag that aren't actually really even a problem in the first place. And just get all of those types of thoughts out there, and that is going to help you with your ideation and your innovation problem, uh, I think, in a, in a, a much more measurable and re replicable kind of way. Another tool that I use very frequently myself, and I know a couple of my designers that I work with often, is um, the concept of oblique strategies uh, by uh, Brian, Brian Eno, was the musician Brian Eno, um, came up with this concept back in the 70s. He used it to uh, record a couple of his albums, including A Green World and some of his classics from that era, uh, Music for Airports, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, and essentially it's a nonlinear thinking device, right? And so it's a deck of cards, and there are digital versions of it available. You can buy them online as well, physical versions, but you, you have a deck of cards that's shuffled, and you basically pull from within that deck. It doesn't really matter if you want to play it, that you pull from the top or if you pull from the middle, and you just use that random card that is drawn and use that random card to help color or change your point of view or the possible solution that you think is appropriate for uh, solving that solution, that problem. It doesn't necessarily help you arrive at the exact right solution. What it helps you do, though, is just twist your mind a little bit so that you think about it from a different angle. You know, what you're trying to do is just kind of try something a little bit different, right? Now, this is, this is also a technique that's used very frequently, if you think about it, on how athletes commonly practice for their types of sports. If you think about what practice does, it's always basically training you on something, a constraint, a time, pressure, space, right? And so what we're trying to do is keep all the rest of the situation except for one angle of it, one portion of it, and then change it, right? Change that one thing in order to force us to put ourselves into a different position. So I have a, I have a card uh, a deck on my computer here. It's a desk, dashboard widget. I'm going to draw one card. So actually I drew two, and one said, what are you thinking right now? Incorporate that. That was one of the ideas. Here's another one. The second card that I drew said, listen to the quiet voice. You know, I mean, so what these can do is just go throw you a little bit off kilter, get you back on your heels, and go, ah, okay, what does that mean? Listen to the quiet voice. What is the quiet voice in this particular project here? Maybe we haven't talked to the users, or maybe we haven't talked to the stakeholders paying for it, or maybe we didn't look at, you know, what the end customer actually wants, right? Um, there's one that I really like. It's, I get it every once in a while. It says, use an inappropriate color, and it's British, so it's spelled C-O-L-U-R, right? C-O-L-O-U-R. Um, and the inappropriate color, you could take it in a very literal sense, right? Uh, what the color is, a hue, right, or a tone. Or you could go use an inappropriate color in terms of mood or temperament or verbiage or whatever it might be, right? So I, I just like those types of tools. I use that, that type of stuff all the time for, for innovation, you know? And I'd like, yeah, to think that is awesome. I'd like to think I'm winning with it. You know, we do, we do win awards for our designs. We frequently yeah. show up and get stuff at Demo Fest. We do really well when we um, present to clients. We've done very well at different startup competitions and things of that nature. So I'd like yeah. to think that these types of 
kind of slightly out there tools definitely help. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, this is exactly why I, I invited you because you are uh, one of the, the biggest thought leaders, especially for mobile applied to learning, right? And, and I wanted to see how you go about creating stuff or helping people create things and see mobile differently. And, and, and it seems to me, I, and the interest is uh, my latest interest too, is card decks for facilita facilitating design. Uh, do you ever use those with the client, or do you use those with your team only, and then present the solution that you did arrive at with the client? So typically we use card sorting um, activities internally. Uh, I have been on a couple different uh, day-long workshops with clients where they are trying to do some higher level strategy, and we've gone through card sorting activities with them. Um, depending on the company culture, that can be seen as not very productive though. So like uh, we went to say for, we actually went to a, a, a equipment manufacturing company and it really wasn't particularly well received. But then we went to a consumer products and goods uh, company, something that had a little bit of a shorter product cycle and it run, went over really, really well. So I think, you know, you, you definitely have to understand the situation that you're going into um, when you start to use some of these types of tools. Uh, I don't think that, like, say, for example, I would go into a heavy industrial company and pull out uh, the Brian Eno oblique strategies deck and, like, say, let's get to it, you know? I mean, I just, I'm not sure if that's going to go over that well. But, you know, they may, they may be willing to uh, go down the path of, like, say, for example, a Kanban or a traditional card sorting type of activity with you uh, if you can at least keep the pacing moving quickly, you know? And it has to remain outcome-based. You have to have something at the end of the activity. If you don't have an outcome, there's no there's no Fortune 500 company that's going to invite you back in uh, the door if you don't have like basically a deliverable at the end of that activity. So you got to come out with the out of the room with something. That's so true. Yeah, that is so true. Uh, and I I want to see later. Maybe you can share offline, and I'll post it uh, later on the uh, the resources you're sharing. Even the deck that you said you have there virtually there, uh, Brian's uh, uh, deck as well. Um, I I have a link to that myself, um, and I'll post that too. Yeah. And some other design facilitation uh, decks that I'm familiar with. Uh, with uh, for example, the method kit. I'm not sure you've used that one before. Oh, I'd like to check that out. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent one. I'm going to send you that link, too, and, and maybe you can apply it and let us know how that happens. Uh, they, like they have several uh, types of, of decks uh, for different situations, like uh, prototyping and stuff like that, uh, planning, project planning and stuff. Um, so uh, I think since we went to the tool discussion, went for tools for design, like a mindset and, and, and facilitating the... The, the whole design process and not exactly tools to develop, I take it that most of what your team does is, is custom, is programming, is actually going in there and programming and Swift and stuff like that, and you don't use actual authoring tools. We do like not. Like stuff. Yeah, we do not. Because if you want to really build, uh, as I'm, I'm getting from you, if you really want to build something that is that takes full advantage of mobile, you have to go into the native mobile uh, programming languages and build for that, right? I am a I'm a pretty firm believer in that. Yeah, I am. Cool, really nice. All right, uh, do you have any other remarks? I think we're good. We went over time here, and I'm gonna stitch together the the videos because uh, of technical issues here and there, and put them out there. No, I'm 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 uh, anxious to see it get posted. And thanks again very much for having me here today, Enzo. Oh, thank you, thank you, and uh, um, I really look up to you as uh, as a leading man in, in mobile applications for. Uh, I, I appreciate that, and it's always a pleasure to see you at uh, at events. So next time, uh, beers on me. <laughs> <laughs> see ya. Thank you. Talk to you later, Enzo. Bye bye. Bye.